Hey there, MC Schrankel here coming to you from Lockdown and today we're going to be talking about the concept of metabolic flexibility. Metabolic flexibility is apparently the capacity for the organism to adapt fuel oxidation to fuel availability. What does it actually mean? It means, generally speaking, that our ability to take fats and carbs and ingest them and turn them into energy. And that flexibility is important sign of our health and well-being. So in this presentation, we're going to be looking at um, what does this kind of oxidation actually mean for that well-being? Why is it a good thing? What makes it challenging? Because a lot of people talk about you're not metabolically flexible in certain states. And if that's the case, how the heck do you fix it? So what does this fat to carb or carb to fat oxidation actually mean? Um, well, uh, it's about energy to power cells. So cells do a whole bunch of things from skin building, bone remodeling, how our guts are able to move, how neurons in our brain uh, signal and fire. That's really important. And it's really about how life goes on in our bodies. And that's what this chart is really about, is just looking at there are many types of uh, fuels that we can ingest, well, at least three, proteins, carbs, and fats. This is particularly looking at the carb and fat processes and how oxygen is used for these main processes. And you'll notice I'm not talking about a few things. I'm not talking about ketone bodies. I'm not talking about the phosphocreatine cycle. We're focusing strictly on how main fuels are oxidized because that's one of the ways in which we achieve energy. Uh, and all of this works great. You don't even have to think about metabolic flexibility pretty much when you're in what's known as energy balance, is that the amount of uh, foods, fats, carbs, um, but let's talk about food. So the amount of real food that you ingest is in balance with the energy that you need to do what you're doing. And so everything is going really well in that case. Let's, let's just pull back a little bit from talking about those processes to how we get to that state. Like how does food get to this state of breaking down into energy? Quick review. Uh, some of this you're going to get right away and some of this might be a little bit of a surprise. Um, is that food enters the gut via the mouth. As we know, we chew stuff up, we get into the gut. But a lot of people will talk about, and then food goes into the bloodstream, but that's missing a rather big piece in the middle there, is that food as it's digested uh, gets translated into processes or particles, really, that are sufficient to cross into the blood, but not into the, just the blood. Food goes into the hepatic vein, and that is a big trunk that goes from the gut into the liver where it is purified and further processed. So one of the reasons you know if you're, you can ask the question, am I fasting or not? Have I broken my fast? Is well, was what you put in your mouth gonna go through to the liver or somehow get not through the liver and, and just move right into the bloodstream uh, generally? And if it's going into the liver to get processed, it's technically breaking a fast, but that's an aside. Anyway, uh, in the liver then, Depending on other signals that's going on in the body, um, resources like glucose will be shunted into the bloodstream in those red blood cells that we've talked about before. And these red blood cells, as we've also talked about before, the bloodstream is a transport mechanism. It's the rivers that run through the body, and all tissue is effectively uh, bathed in this transport mechanism by capillaries that will pick up based on a signal, say, oh, this is passing by, I can pick this up and shove this into a cell that it needs. And that's kind of the case in the next picture we see here where sugars and fats are processed to be oxidized, is that various signals, transporters are in the bloodstream saying, hey, that one of them is called GLUT4, as a, a transport uh, thing that's been turned on by insulin, it says, hey, I've got some glucose for you, please take this glucose, the cell uh, responds with its processes to be able to take in that um, nutrient and break it down, then things go extremely well in this case. And so that's kind of the high level view of um, what's going on inside of food as it moves from our mouth to our gut, through the liver to the bloodstream uh, to become called upon by the cell. Uh, but what happens next and when we get this thing of metabolic flexibility is that what fuel gets picked up to be oxidized usually depends on state. So this is where the metabolic flexibility comes in, is when do we shift from using, say, more fats to more sugars? And this is a nice diagram from an article called Metabolic Flexibility and Healthy Disease that explains that um, when we're in sleep state or after food's digested, stored fat's broken down to get used, 
while glucose that might be available from foods that we've been eating too also gets stored. And as soon as we start eating, the fat release that we've had slows down or halts. But as soon as we start moving, our muscles trigger both fat and glucose burning to support higher energy demands than when we're at rest or just sitting at our desk. And fat releases from the adipose tissues, uh, glucose is released uh, and goes up. And sometimes that, uh, especially the fat oxidation, goes way up depending on uh, the demand from the exercise that we might be doing or whatever movement it is we're, we're doing. It could be running away from a tiger. It's not really exercise. It's uh, surviving. Anyway, metabolic flexibility is then uh, compromised when we don't uh, shift states. And that one of the biggies there is when we are in a chronically fed state. So we never give ourselves a chance not to have food uh, coming into our system, that chronic fedness um, can, can, especially at a certain amount, uh, can really screw up um, this process that you're looking at here from the um, uh, glycolytic pathways and the oxidative, beta oxidative pathways for oxidizing it. The fuels, um, they get overwhelmed, literally. And there's a kind of a, a cool article that refers to this as metabolic gridlock. And effectively, it says when things are going right, uh, consumption, if you have a high carbohydrate meal, um, usually referred to as CHO, you know, mainly carbohydrate, which just means that carbs are the majority macronutrient of fats and proteins in a meal. So we shift to using glucose uh, from fat for energy. So we're, we're using more glucose than fat when uh, we get this kind of meal. And this is tested by the amount of carbon in our respiration. It's referred to as the respiration quotient. And what is that ratio between uh, CO2 and oxygen that's coming out of us? And so following eating, we tend to go back to, interestingly, a mix in the mitochondria of fat and glucose. So things settle down and we're processing both. However, in cases of obesity or type 2 diabetes or metabolic syndrome, this switching doesn't really happen anymore. And it's effectively because there is just too much fuel available and especially too much fat and glucose metabolism gets shut down, too much glucose and fat metabolism gets shut down. Um, and, and this actually can lead to a break, this overabundance uh, of fuel, is that one of the consequences, as we know from, from the healthy uh, signaling that we've looked at, before is that when we have a healthy signal going on, we get the breakdown of different components of the glucose or the fat to go into the TCAC, the citric acid cycle, which we won't go into detail. You may be saying, hooray, but suffice it to say that when we get this kind of buildup in the cells and this gridlock in the cells is that all that happens is that the cell membrane ends up getting this buildup of electrons that can't be taken away by other uh, parts like the NADH, NAD plus thing breaks effectively. And that means that the fuel cannot be processed. And what does that mean when the fuel cannot be processed? It means that less oxidation actually happens um, maybe there'll be more uh, storage of fats that the, the, the cells will still try to do that, but they can't convert into energy, so adipose tissue goes up. But effectively, the whole system weakens. And when you can't oxidize energy, you feel fatigued as well. So you get into this whole vicious circle of um, feeling like crap. So just to quickly review what's going on uh, in the cell here when we look at this process is that when we're in a kind of chronically fed state, the cellular signaling around how to process that, how to translate that energy, um, eventually will break down. It's like trying to shove stuff into a, a plugged up plumbing system and it just, it backs up. It stops working. It can't handle what you're throwing at it. So you'll hear terms like insulin resistance because that's a, a signaling a hormone to say there's blood sugar available, use it up. Um, and it's like, well, there's nowhere for it to go. We can't do anything with it, and, and things break down. The other side of that is also this, this uh, leptin resistance, which is another hormone associated with adipose tissue, which triggers satiety, and that becomes resistant in the presence of food abundance too. Um, so that satiety cue goes away, and you 
find yourself eating more and getting less value from what you're eating. And another consequence of this is as adipose tissue builds up is that that is an inflammatory uh, container or, or hormonal signaling state. So uh, inflammation also goes up, energy levels go down. And importantly for our discussion here in terms of metabolic flexibility is that the mitochondria, those little orange guys in this particular picture, actually start to weaken. Um, their number goes down. Their size is puny. They're just they're, they're unhealthy. And in fact, what we're talking about is disease state. Um, being created from type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular risk. Um, so we can start to appreciate now what the state's like inside the body that a lot of um, problems can occur. And imagine trying to fight off a disease or a virus if this is the state that your body is in, that it can't produce sufficient energy uh, to feel well, it's got a lot of stuff floating in its system that, that it uh, is trying to manage while there's an incursion into the system from a virus or bacterial infection. No kidding, that's going to be challenging. Well, wh how does this happen? What are the factors contributing to these effects? And it doesn't take uh, rocket science here to figure out that our... Uh, culture has been engineered to induce these effects. And I say culture because these are often referred to as lifestyle di diseases, type 2, diabetes, and so on. Uh, but chronic sedentarism, sitting around all the time, and an excess of available fuel. Um, we have calorie abundance. Uh, we can reach for calories uh, in a moment's note. Be, uh, I, I bet anybody listening to this has access to calories by barely moving out of wherever they're watching this. This is our culture now. And so given that, it's very difficult um, to not be in a state of chronic sedentarism and excess fuel. It takes more work to do that than to do the work to be healthy. But the bottom line is, is that this is effectively resulting in insufficient robust mitochondria. Uh, and when we don't have enough effective mitochondria to process the stuff that's in our system, something's got to change. We either need more mitochondria or less uh, fuel or both. But before we get into more about mitochondria, and yes, we're going to go there a little bit, let's, let's just put this in perspective. So um, the whole metabolism piece, what are we really talking about? Well, here, so here's a brief aside. Is that We start with basics. Everything in metabolism goes to chemistry. And if you had a hard time with chemistry in high school, or you're there now and you're dealing with moles and, and uh, balancing equations and so on, um, it's actually worth going through because this is where it connects to life. And that's really cool that all these little bits of chemistry start to make a whole lot of awesome sense. But in this case, you'll be pleased to know we're not going down the chemistry route particularly. I'm just using this as, as to say this is the starting point of building blocks that get us to that mitochondria place. And that is that when you collect a bunch of these chemicals together and life happens evolutionarily, you get cells as the next sort of step up. Um, and, and cells are cool because they have the reproducing material. They've got a nucleus that says you can do these really cool things and, and replicate. Here's, a, here's another look at our, our favorite cell picture. picture. Uh, it looks so rich and full and happy and just you know, like an incredible machine, an organic machine. And the cool thing about cells is when they get together, they form tissues. Uh, and there are all sorts of tissues in the body. Well, actually, uh, there's four types of tissue. There's epithelial, or kind of skin cells. There's connective tissue, you know, cartilage and so on. Muscular tissue, we're talking a lot about muscles. And there's the uh, nervous tissue, which are all slightly different, but run these same kind of cellular processes within them. And when you get a bunch of tissues together, you get organs, like the heart and the liver that we were just talking about. And you can see that big hepatic vein. It's huge. Um, and then these organs build into systems and these systems interconnect with each other. It's hugely complex to become an organism that moves all of these systems together. 
that's incredible. You just like, wow, that happened. That's amazing that this even happened. Because it all then goes back to how does how does this keep going? How does this um, process of complex systems interconnected with systems or organ systems to organisms happen? Well, this happens because of homeostatic metabolism. And this chart in the background here um, is all of the me metabolic processes, the processes of taking one thing and synthesizing it into something else that is part of the human being. And in fact, if we circle in here, you can see a bit of that citric acid cycle that we talked about before. And all of that comes all the way back to these kind of building blocks. So the process of metabolism then is taking these within the cells and so on, create the tissue, and all of that is done by a process of synthesis or, or metabolic processes that are, are changing, translating one bit to another bit. So we ingest food, it gets translated into these smaller particles of chemical wonderfulness that can be used in different ways to replicate ourselves. And uh, it's incredibly complex, it's incredibly wonderful, but it helps us, I hope this helps give us a context for saying, okay, so why are we talking about the mitochondria so much so that we get back to here? And what we're saying is that limited uh, mitochondria in number and function, what happen when we sit around and eat too much? All sorts of bad stuff happens. <clears throat> and therefore, we can say that metabolic flexibility is a sign of robust good health. Metabolic inflexibility is a fantastic sign of disease. And if we just check back in here about about the process that we have this sense that when things are working well we're switching fuel sources from oxygen and fat appropriately for the to meet the demand uh, when these systems are not being taxed and when we have too much food they break down the cool thing is though that we need to work our tissue out our mitochondria cells are another example of plasticity that use it or lose it systems we work them, they work better for us. One quickie on uh, the mitochondria itself is I've been focusing on it as this energy hub, and that's usually pretty much how it's discussed, but it has these other roles, is that not only is it producing energy or ATP, but related to that are reactive oxygen species that so connect with the free radicals, calcium in terms of muscle cell signaling for being able to fire. It's also got inflammatory responses. And what looks like a couple of negative things here is cell death and senescence. Senescence is the heading towards cell death, the signaling that it's time to um, get rid of a particular cell. And uh, these are actually really critical uh, features. As I said last time, inflammation is a really important response. So we need healthy signaling of inflammation and robust uh, reactive oxygen species gets, is fine uh, as long as there's complementary processes that, that balance these. But the main thing here is that metabolic flexibility, the process in the mitochondria uh, in particular, is more than just metflex. It's a sign of so many other kind of healthful processes going on. So key takeaway now is that you put sedentarism on one side and overabundance of fuel on the other at a constant rate, make it chronic on both sides, and things break. So that's metabol uh, the payoff of that is metabolic inflexibility. We can't use these fuel sources. But we can fix it, coming back to the state that mitochondria, like any other tissue in the body, is adapted to demand. So what do we have to do to, to get well, to build up our metabolic flexibility, is that we um, build more, more highly functional mitochondria. And when I say especially in the muscle tissues, because that's where a lot of the research has been looking in terms of something like insulin resistance resistance and how to address that so that you're more insulin sensitive, which means that um, basically the stuff that's in your bloodstream for energy can be processed. Again, insulin resistance happens when uh, the insulin signals cannot be heard by the body. The, the body can't act on those signals. So how do we do this? How do we build more functional mitochondria? Uh, well, we, uh, we move. Uh, in fact, that's one way that we can do this. 
Uh, and it, it, the cool thing is it's effectively the inverse of what makes a problem chronic inactivity and chronic overeating. Invert those and you get the positives, but you need to do both. This is another key takeaway is that to create more and more functional mitochondria, you need both. You need to have more nutrient-dense, less fuel-dense foods, whole foods, in other words, mostly plants, that's an easy win, and you need to increase the load on your body, which is kind of why the last episode was talking so much about the benefits of strength and doing strength practices, is that these are actually like vitamins. They are essential to metabolic flexibility, and as we said, metabolic flexibility is a marker of health. So when we're looking at food, again, nutrient-dense calorie light. These mushrooms are a fantastic example of they are high in all sorts of vitamins, protein, great sources, but extremely calorie light. It's, it's hard to OD on mushrooms unless you pour a ton of olive oil on them. And even then, you're kind of working hard here to get something to happen. Also, the great thing about whole foods is that it's not just an energy source. Even though they are calorie light, they are nutrient-dense, which means, for instance, uh, from something like the broccoli here, you get not only uh, the phytonutrients that are great for digestion and cool stuff we don't even know about how, how good it is for us yet. Nutrition is still kind of an early science. But something like magnesium, which is so important um, for just about every process uh, in the body, is available f for free for eating these um, slow digesting foods and that's the other thing about paste fuel release is that that means the satiety or the feeling of fullness will last longer because it takes longer to digest these fuels um, and or foods really uh, and so you feel full longer but there's not a super abundance uh, of processed food type effects of eating um, too much food for our bloodstream to handle so that's that but then the next thing that really helps out, so that's, that's reducing the fuel load on the body. Next thing about increasing the load here is that that will actually have an effect on the size and number of mitochondria in the muscle cells. And the payoff of that is rather than a cell getting hit with too much material to make it work harder to get out the same amount of energy, it can work much less to produce the same amount of energy and therefore be more resilient. And there's a bunch of other um, fuel saving properties by uh, not having to tax the cell to draw on everything that's going on with its ADP to ATP conversion. And I promise we're not going to get into that. But the important thing here is that you get really good knock on effects of increased number and size of mitochondria, like the thing you've heard about with free radicals, uh, goes down and also you can burn more fat. So for those who are interested in body composition or building lean tissue or reducing the amount of inflammatory non-contractile tissue, that is our adipose or fat tissue, this is a fantastic and necessary, again, necessary thing to do to maintain metabolic flexibility. And this is just a quickie going back to the um, a discussion that we had on strength training that showed that different types of strength training trigger the muscles in different ways where resistance training is really powerful for triggering um, muscle fiber growth. Uh, high intensity training, endurance training are excellent for increasing the number of mitochondria and the size and function of the mitochondria. So the next takeaway really is again if you want to fix and metabolic inflexibility and up one's metabolic flexibility, then the two easy things are increase your load on yourself and time of movement and intensity of movement and increase the nutrient density, which usually has the side effect of reducing the fuel density um, to improve all the good things, the kinds of tissues in the organism that we want to increase. In fact, these two things alone um, are like medicine for every system in the body. They help every tissue in the body, uh, which makes health generally easier. It makes everything easier because it has incredible effects, including on stressors and um, stress hormones and stress signalers. So everything is just better. But in some bodies are work, especially the way we have created our cultures right now.
is that we weren't evolved. More time than not has been spent in an environment that just naturally would get us to be in a lower caloric state most of the time and a more mobile state most of the time. We've worked really hard to reduce what it takes to keep us alive and healthy. Um, the cool thing is, is that we're extremely adaptable to get into that work. So as soon as we start doing that work at any time at all, we start to reap the rewards of that work almost immediately. It can be very challenging to get into that if we are feeling um, metabolically inflexible uh, because as we said, that we're in a fatigue state. So we have to have that effort to break out of that vicious cycle of sedentarism. But as we start to do that, again, the rewards are fantastic. Uh, and they do happen. So move more, more whole food, metabolic flexibility comes as a side effect. And that, even though the start out can be hard, the, the payoff is enormous and it starts to happen immediately. And so um, metabolic flexibility is about energy processing, balancing storage with demand. Um, and it's really trying to get to a balance of load and fuel because it's when that metabolism of energy and rest and action are working, that things work really, really well. And next time we get together, we'll look at the um, eating part in a little more detail. We looked at strength in terms of um, the building of the muscle tissue. We'll come on to looking at the eating side. And may I just uh, say that uh, if you have questions, please do reach out and ask. And one more time, that there's uh, if you want to outsource that strength part, of your work to um, another trusted party rather than have to figure it out for yourself that will touch on all these components for the loading for metabolic flexibility. Here's the uh, URL again, tinyurl.com slash calimove hyphen MC with a coupon in 5MC till June 13th. Um, and also I, I, I did make that pizza and if you want to know how it's, it's an awesome sourdough pizza recipe. Um, that blends carbs and, and uh, fats together, or really great, great crust and food. We eat food um, for a great payoff after a really high interval intense workout. Uh, so thank you very much. And again, any questions, uh, send me an email, put in a comment. Um, I'll look forward to talking to you next time. Thanks very much.